Hey everyone, this is Jeff Palais, Ballopedia's Editor-in-Chief. Last week, we kicked off our Ballopedia Society Spring Membership Campaign, and we're asking you to join our other generous donors who've committed to make a monthly donation to Ballopedia. By making a monthly gift, you'll help Ballopedia provide daily, weekly, and monthly newsletters and podcasts just like this one that are informative and, yes, free. There's no way we could keep Americans up to date with accurate information and reporting if it weren't for our Ballopedia Society members. Will you join this group of Ballopedia supporters? Please visit donate.ballopedia.org slash Ballopedia Society to sign up. Welcome to On the Ballot with Ballopedia where we take a closer look at the week's top political stories. Ballotpedia connects people to politics by providing neutral, nonpartisan, and reliable information on our government, how it works, and where it's headed. I'm Victoria Rose, and thanks for being with us. Today, we're joined by Neil Maholtra, who is a professor of political economy in the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. He has written over 60 articles on a wide range of topics, including American politics, polarization, and survey methodology. His research has been published in the American Political Science Review, the American Journal of Political Science, the Journal of Politics, Science, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, just to name a few. Neil, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, we're excited for our conversation. To start, what made you want to pursue a career as an academic and why political economy? And just to add to that, what is political economy? So I'll start with the first question. A lot of people define political economy in different ways. At least in my institution, it's applying methods from economics to the study of politics. So you can imagine methods including statistical analysis, ascertaining cause and effect, and um, game theory, essentially. So yeah, I guess like what got me interested to study politics as a profession is during the 2000 presidential election, uh, which I, you know, your younger readers or listeners may not remember that or be alive for it, but it was a very contested election where basically it was a tie election between George Bush and Al Gore. And I just remember I'm not a morning person at all. In college, I would wake up at 10 or 11. But um, during that election, the Supreme Court would like hold hearings and I would wake up at 6 a.m. to listen to the news and who was winning the election and what they were saying in the courts. So I figure if I was waking up five hours earlier normally than I do, this is something I'm probably passionate about studying and pursuing a career in. That's a nice indicator, I guess. So can you tell us a little bit about your work at Stanford's Graduate School of Business? Yeah, sure. So at Stanford, I, I do many things. So um, as you mentioned, I do a lot of research on issues like American politics, uh, survey methodology and polarization. But I also teach classes on business ethics, impact measurement, and more generally, the role of business in society. And as part of my job, I also direct something called the Center for Social Innovation, which investigates how businesses can be a force for social good. Very interesting. We're going to get into all of that today in our discussion. And to start, we're going to talk about polarization, which is a term that is increasingly used to describe our political times. It's something we we constantly hear about in the media and never-ending stream of polling, think pieces, and things like that. So without giving too much of your research away at the top, what made you interested in studying polarization? Well, I think it was just uh, kind of going back to the 2000 election, um, you know, just to kind of remind some of your listeners, that was actually the first election map which had this very stark red-blue divide. Um, if you look at election maps from before 2000, uh, they were very kind of multicolored and mixed up. But in 2000, you get this kind of pattern where the center of the country is very red, the coasts tend to be very blue, um, the Great Lakes are very blue. Um, and so I, I think kind of just that stark change in 2000 uh, generated a lot of research interest, including my own, in whether America is polarized, what the consequences of polarization are, et cetera. Yeah, we see that not only at the national level, but if you go back to state executive and legislative makeups during like the 90s, it was much more diverse than what we see today. Like typical like red states, as we would call them today, weren't necessarily red back then, basically. Yeah. So I think a lot of that has to do with like how slow the realignment of the South actually took. So, you know, Mississippi had a Democratic legislature for a long time, West Virginia, Alabama, you know, these states that we consider deep red states were actually had conservative Democratic majorities um, up until the 2010 election, essentially. And it just shows you how slow the process of American politics is with things like the incumbency advantage. 
you know, ever since the Republicans became the more Southern party in 1968, it actually took something like 40 years for all of that to work its way through the system. Very fascinating. I thought to start on the polarization topic, we could look at some of your research dealing with dating apps, which is kind of fun. I've never personally been on a dating app, but I have heard anecdotal stories that political leanings play a big part in who you're going to engage with on certain apps. So is that what you saw in your research when studying that? Essentially, um, I think our research showed that it's important, although you know it, it's dwarfed by, I think, what you would normally think of as important on online dating sites, like you know how tall someone is, um, just like what if they're a uh, good looking person, like things like that tend to matter a lot more. But to put it in context, politics, we found out to be about like, let's say half the size of things like religion and race, which we view as, I would say those are kind of important factors people use in selecting mates on online dating sites. So the fact that politics is, you know, in the neighborhood of something like religion or race suggested is pretty important because like religion, it's sort of a reflection of someone's values. And then some of your more recent research has studied how the media affects our perceptions of polarization. Most people hunches is that our politics is based a lot on the news we consume. So what did you learn about how media coverage of polarization actually affects polarization of Americans? Yeah. So, you know, I think a big thing in the data is actually people are not that polarized when it comes to issues. So if you ask people kind of what are your opinions on things like abortion or gay marriage or taxes... The parties are actually not that far apart. You know, the politicians are very far apart, but the actual people in the electorate aren't. But when you ask questions about like, do you trust people in the other party? You know, how worried do you feel towards people in the other party? It's like very far apart. So there's kind of this puzzle, which is why do people not like members of the other party, even though they don't actually disagree with them that much on the issues? And so one of my hypotheses, which I found evidence for, is that the media actually creates this narrative of polarization. And that when the media depicts Americans as very divided, it can actually be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So even though people's issue positions don't change, it makes them dislike the other side more because the media kind of presents stereotypes and caricatures of extreme partisans. So it's kind of like a vicious cycle that we're polarized, but then they exacerbate it and then we become sort of more polarized. That's right. That's a good way to put it. Is there anything that the media ecosystem can do to stop inflaming the polarization? Well, I think generally the problem is I think the media, this longstanding research on this tends to be very episodic. So what I mean by that is they like telling individual stories, but individual stories can mask like broad patterns. So the best example of episodic coverage is how the media covers crime. So um, you probably, when you open up Twitter or anything, you probably see hundreds of stories of like crime in San Francisco, for example. I'm sure you've experienced or New York City or Chicago, or you'll see a story which is like Nordstrom store is closing down because of crime in San Francisco. So these are like episodic stories and they may or may not reflect um, actual broad trends and statistics. Um, so uh, it is probably true that property crime is very high in a place like San Francisco. But actually, if you look at the violent crime data, it, it actually is not very high. It hasn't increased that much. So I think you can apply the same logic to politics, which is instead of like telling stories or episodic coverage of a certain politician doing something very extreme or a certain individual doing something very extreme, the media could instead focus on broader trends and statistics to kind of show that actually the public is not as extreme on issues um, as the me- it might be depicted if you look at episodes. That makes sense. You also suggested that maybe some of this future research should determine if this media coverage is going to deter people from actually participating in politics or losing trust in political institutions. So have you done any research into that? I actually haven't. But I think that is an interesting topic, and it's actually become more easier easier to study that kind of stuff um, because of the better access we have to voter file data. Um, so you know, it, it tended to be that people would kind of just ask someone in a survey whether they're going to vote or not, but now we can actually kind of investigate whether people actually do vote um, based on all the good voter file records we have. So I haven't done that stuff, but it is a very promising question to look at.
Well, here's an encouragement to do it because I'm very interested in that sort of stuff. You also talked about how Americans are actually much closer on some policy issues than they perceive themselves to be. Can you kind of give us a few more examples of those policies? Yeah, a classic example is like abortion. And it is true that the Democrats in America have become more extreme on abortion in the last five years or so. But if you look at traditionally the data on abortion, Republicans and Democrats actually have a, a broad consensus on abortion which is that they do not believe that abortion should be illegal. I mean, you kind of see that in the states where, um, you know, for example, like even in a deep red state like Kansas, when they can't pass abortion, you know, making abortion illegal. Um, But at the same time, Americans don't really believe in abortion on demand or abortion for any reason. So I think there's a general consensus, if you look in the survey data, that Abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. That's like one example. If you look at an issue like gay marriage, there's very high, strong majorities that both you know, people, gay people should be allowed to get married. Similarly, that gay people should not be discriminated against in the workplace, things like that. Um, so just on like many issues, you would think that like the policies, people are very extreme, but they actually have broad consensus. Interesting. So this research that you produced was back in 2016, and a lot has happened to our political landscape since then. So can you tell us about how media coverage of polarization and our relationship to that coverage has changed since then? I mean, Trump, I think, changed the game. I mean, I think a lot of my research that was pre-Trump it probably has is, is gotten worse or exacerbated. So for example, on the online dating stuff, I actually think that the data we have from 2010, I think after Trump, politics is way more important in people's mate selection than it used to be. Similarly, I think in the Trump post-Trump era, the media has heightened polarization much, much more. Um, and I mean, I think there is like a legitimate question on what is appropriate for the media to do. So, for example, there are like when you one thing we have learned is that you can have a minority of people who are very extreme that can make a big difference. So, January six is an example of that. So I'm not kind of saying that the media should not like report on January 6th. Um, but this is sort of the tension, which is you can have like very small people who are very extreme make a big difference, even if the typical person in both parties is not very extreme. Let's turn our attention to that intersection of politics and the economy, which we kind of touched on at the beginning. You've personally been interested in the relationship between Silicon Valley and Democrats. Um, you previously predicted that Silicon Valley's support for the Democrats was going to increase or grow over the years, but it's actually turned out to be a little bit more complicated. Can you explain that dynamic for our listeners? Yeah. So a lot of the research, again, I did was before Trump, and it was sort of in the Obama era. There's a lot of debates on to whether something called the Obama coalition exists. Um, I do believe it exists, but the people who don't believe it exists think that like, oh, Obama was just like a cool, smart guy and a lot of people liked him. And that's what the Obama coalition was. But I actually believe that Obama was a unique political figure and that he was able to kind of bring diverse groups of people together in support of like large national majorities, which no other president has really been able to do since. So, you know, I would say that the Silicon Valley technology industry was like a core part of the Obama coalition. I think a lot of Democrats believe that um, social media and technology helped Obama get elected in 2008. And that um, that basically it was like a clean industry and it was OK for elite Democrats to go back and forth into that industry. Um, so, for example, you had a lot of Obama alumni that then worked for Silicon Valley companies in like government affairs departments, things like that. The 2016 election, which I obviously could not predict, I think very few people predicted that something like that would happen in 2014 or 2015, changed everything because now a lot of Democrats blame the social media companies for the election of Trump. So, whereas Obama very cleverly used social media to win his election, Trump cleverly used it to win his election. So then there became a lot of concerns about misinformation, disinformation, things like that. And it sort of has, I think, created this turn against the technology industry broadly, which you also see in sort of non-social media industries. So for example, a big thing I talked about in my op-ed was that Biden specifically excluded Tesla from his EV initiatives and, you know, messaging, which, which, you know, it was kind of very politically driven, Mm -hmm. I would argue. When I was reading your op-ed, I even thought of the example of California Proposition 22 from the election in 2020, which was backed by Uber, but received a lot of opposition from Democrats in California. So those kinds of tensions. 
Yeah, so labor market regulation is huge. So Obama basically was kind of okay with the gig economy. Biden, with his you know various appointments, is much more pro labor. Um, and then another is antitrust enforcement. Whereas Obama had a very narrow view of antitrust, he did not really do much antitrust enforcement against tech. Biden hasn't done so much far either, but he's definitely made more waves about it, and there definitely is more tension um, with respect to antitrust. You've also researched private regulation, which is where corporations choose to behave a certain way without government intervention. In one particular paper, you argue that such private regulation by corporation kind of preempts much more stringent regulation by the government. So how did you come to that conclusion? Well, we did a lot of surveying where we basically gave people different scenarios. And this not only includes the mass public, but also activist groups and government officials. And we basically measure support for strict government regulation under different scenarios, including scenarios where companies are going part of the way there. And we see that support for stringent government regulation falls when companies kind of do partial regulation. Um, There's many reasons why that can exist, um, but it actually kind of goes back to the social media issue as well, because I think that's things you see like Facebook doing. Facebook has its own board where they monitor misinformation, disinformation, it's independent, etc. And so I think one of the reasons they have this board is to kind of prevent more onerous government regulation that might be more inefficient. And we've kind of seen this with electric vehicles and the advancement of those and how companies are setting their own timelines to adopt those technologies instead of waiting on the government to really adopt those. And part of it is not just on electrification, but also just fuel efficiency generally. So you know you you can see potentially com- you know different companies increasing the fuel efficiency of their fleets in advance and trying to preempt government from having more stringent standards. So for example, in California, who knows if this is going to actually happen, but they claim they're going to ban electric uh, non electric vehicles um, in a pretty short amount of time. So that's the kind of regulation I think many car companies are trying to avoid. That makes sense. In the same realm, there's been a lot of scrutiny over political choices businesses make over the last few years. And it seems like voters are paying increasingly more attention to businesses and who they patronize, quote, kind of like voting with their dollars. So what role do you think corporations can play in decreasing polarization? Yeah, so I've actually done some research on this. Um, and, And actually, my research finds that very few people like boycott companies from politics, but they're actually attracted to companies that share their political values. So it's more of like kind of an in-group love kind of thing rather than an out-group hate. Um, but I think companies are in a very difficult position. And I, I just don't think they know what to do and how to handle this. Because if they, they, they would prefer to just not take any political stands. Um, but sometimes they're kind of forced to take a political stand on some issue or like you have outsiders kind of pressuring them to. And sort of the absence of taking a stand is taking a stand in the eyes of different of the public or, or the activist groups. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't have a good answer to like how, how it's companies should question. handle this. Yeah. And I mean, you just see like, I mean, the Bud Light is just like a classic example. I mean, I think it's very, ep- that's a great episodic thing that I was talking about, but it just shows you that like, you just cannot please anybody. And so you're just kind of like kind of stumbling to from bad situation to bad situation. If you look at the companies that are most successful, they basically have like a niche brand that kind of speaks to a certain core audience. So an example would be like Patagonia or Apple or something like that. And then they're just like, oh, well, these are our values. These are our brand. And if you don't like it, you don't have to buy our product. We have enough of this segment. But if you're like a generic company like Bud Light or Walmart or something like that, uh, I think it's much more difficult. Yeah, much more difficult to cater to all the viewpoints out there. My final question for you it relates to neutrality and kind of an encouragement to our listeners. What advice would you give to our listeners as to how they can cut through some of this narrative or maybe how they might dodge the way it can warp their own political attitudes? Oh, that's a really great question. I mean, I guess I would say I teach a class on business ethics and this, so this comes up. So I would say there's two things that are helpful. So one is having a really good distinction between facts and values. So to realize that people are not entitled to their own facts, but they are entitled to their own values. And so facts are things that we should not compromise on, like there's things that are just true and not true. But actually, what we do with those facts um, are things that should be open to debate. And we conflate those a lot. So an example would be, I think there's high scientific consensus that the Earth is warming and that this is due to human combustion of fossil fuels. So the question is, what do you do with that fact? And there's legitimate disagreements. 
you could say, okay, we should really stringently restrict the economy. Other people would say no. So that's like a fair disagreement people would have. And then I think the second thing I do see personally is that I have friends from all different viewpoints and persuasions. And the, the most important thing is that they're kind people, they're really intelligent people. And so I just love hearing different viewpoints. Um, and as long as you have kind of a strong sense of core ethics, um, I, I think having kind of diverse groups of friends is a, a, a good thing to have. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, thanks for joining us again. And for our listeners, you can check out Neil's work and learn more about some of what we chatted about by checking out the links in our show notes. Make sure you subscribe to On the Ballot wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Victoria Rose, and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.